COVID-19 seems to be over, and it really wasn't a game. But the old football rule applies. After the game is before the game. And after the pandemic is before the pandemic. The post-pandemic period offers a critical opportunity to fortify global health architecture with an emphasis on equity, preparedness, and resilience. Welcome to the panel, Health for All. Good afternoon, all of you. Very proud to be with you today. Being the moderator of the panel, my name is Rosen Plevneliev. I was very proud to serve as a president of Bulgaria 2012-2017, and I'm a very proud member of NJC board. Now, we start with the panel. You would all agree it's a very important one, probably is the most important one. Why is that? Because it's linked to something very important to people, and that's life, that's health. When we arranged all those panels, it was very important to link the previous one to the now starting one. The one was linked to a greener and cleaner and safer planet. Planet is a symbol of life. And now we're talking about health, which is what all people want and what all people are wishing. A decent and a good life. Great leaders, and I promised you two important things. Of course, the one is we will start end on time. It's very important to value the time of everyone. Second, is even more important. We will try to integrate the audience as much as I can. Please prepare your questions. Get ready. And uh, we are starting right now. My first speaker, uh, of course, everybody knows her. And not just here in the room, but in the planet. Madam, I'm sorry if I say it right, Madam Winnie Banima, she is not just the executive director of UNAIDS, but she is also and the Secretary General of the United Nations. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Prevnadiev. I hope I've said it right too. You said my name right. And distinguished panelists, it's an honor to be on this panel with you and thank you all for coming. The question that was put is how to achieve health for all. I start from my premise, my belief, is that healthcare is a human right for everyone on this planet, everyone everywhere. It's a human right. So I'm one of those old-fashioned people who believe that it should be provided for free. It's a right. It's a right, and the state should provide. That's me. I know many others don't. Others think it should be sold, it should be whatever. I think it's a right and should be provided for everyone. I work on HIV AIDS. I'm going to use HIV AIDS to speak about health for all because what works to prevent and to end AIDS really will be in principle the same things that you use to deliver health and prevent other diseases and cure other diseases. With HIV, today we have 1.3 million people who are infected every year. So it's, an, it's a pandemic that is still going on. 1.3 million were infected last year, and that is a number that's decreasing, but not so fast. We had 4,000 4, new infections amongst girls and young women every week. Every week, 4,000 new infections globally for young girls, for girls and women. One life was lost every minute in terms of deaths last year. Someone's dying every minute of HIV-related illness. Then we have 40 million people globally who are living with HIV. Out of those, there are 9.2 who are not on treatment. 31.8 are on treatment. That's a huge achievement made globally. But we still have 9.2 not on treatment. Now. 
Actually, I want to commend Azerbaijan. I'm sitting here with the minister whom I was just speaking to yesterday. Azerbaijan is one of the countries in this region making rapid progress to reduce new infections, to stop deaths. And I'm going to talk about four things that need to happen for us to end this disease globally. We have it in the SDGs, it's a target. SDG number three on health has a target to end this disease by 2030 as a public health threat. But here are the things that must happen for us to get to there. And these things are the same things that must happen to end any other future pandemic or even to give health for all. First, I talked about this yesterday. Diseases such as HIV are driven by inequalities. And unless you end certain inequalities, you will not end these diseases. The first one I mentioned yesterday was the inequalities wired in the financial system globally. You have to have every country able to deliver health for its people. But when you have low and middle income countries trapped in debt, paying more to debt than they are paying to health, you don't have the chance to end a disease like this one or prevent new ones. I gave you some data that I won't repeat, showing you that some countries are paying three, four, five, seven times more to debt repayments than to health. This is not only an injustice, but it is hurting those who are at the bottom. The borrowing, I mentioned the debt. There's also the borrowing costs. The poor countries, developing countries, low-income countries, go to the global markets to borrow, to put in, their, in the health of their people. They borrow four at a four times higher rate than the richest countries, United States of America. Sub-Saharan African countries borrow eight times higher rate than Germany, a very rich country. So these inequalities in the financial system will not let countries deliver health for their people. We need to solve that problem. I gave some examples yesterday of how to solve this, but I really appeal that we look to the summit of the future as the, as the opportunity to get governments to commit to start on the reforms of the international financial architecture that will lead us to a fairer financial system that enables countries to deliver on health. The second is the inequalities that exist for girls and women that have also to be addressed in order to prevent pandemics, to prevent HIV. I mentioned to you I didn't, I'm mentioning now, that in Africa, we see that in the age group between age 15 and age 24, these are girls and young women, three out of four newly infected people are girls. One is a boy, three are girls. And if you go lower to the age bracket of teenagers, age 15 to age 19, in sub-Saharan Africa, six out of seven new infections are girls. This speaks to the inequalities girls face from birth. Many of these are in the policies where they don't have access to education like their brothers. When there is a cost and families are poor, a boy goes, a girl stays away. When there is no support for, we call it now period poverty, sanitary hygiene, a girl will step out of school to, put, to keep her dignity. She will lose many days of school and lose interest. All those reasons, plus sexual violence that exists all over the world, sexual violence where Forceful masculinities lead to unprotected sex. 
These are the reasons that have to be fought. These are not in the health sector, but if you don't deal with these social determinants, you will not stop, prevent infection. So we need to address these through laws that are implemented against violence, sexual violence, gender-based violence. We need to have laws that equalize for boys and girls in education. We need to roll out free education. These are ways to prevent and to guarantee health. Third, so inequalities against women and girls have to be addressed. Third, there are other groups of people who also suffer inequalities that lead to their risk and their infection and ill health. Here I'm talking about, yeah, these ones, some people don't want to hear about them, but they exist, they are there. LGBTQ people, yeah, they are human beings, they deserve rights, human rights like everybody else. When they are criminalized, they hide underground, they don't come forward for treatment, for testing, they get ill, they die, but they also transmit to others. Because there's also something like bisexual. That also happens. What we wish and what is happening is not the same. If we, are, we want health for all, we have to be non-judgmental, we have to deliver to citizens without moralizing, without discrimination, without stigma in the society. These groups, not only LGBTQ, there are people who inject, they may be having mental health issues, they are using drugs, and they are injecting the virus through the, uh, the, the injection. There are sex workers. These, our religions don't accept them, but they are there, and they are selling sex, and they are transmitting also. All these groups of people, we need health systems that don't judge them, but that don't stigmatize them, but that delivers to them what they need for their health and their protection. Because they are part of the society, they will transmit if they are not deliver, getting health care that they deserve as citizens. The fourth I talked of yesterday is this inequality to access to medicine. This is serious, because today, even on the disease I work on, HIV, to give you an example, today there are some technologies on the market in America and Europe. For example, there is what is called a long-acting injectable PrEP, prevention. You can get an injection that will carry you for up to six months even if you meet somebody who is carrying the virus, you won't be infected. So it's a preventive. There is also a new one coming, which is an injectable for treatment. I told you 31 million people on treatment, they are swallowing a tablet mainly every day. But now, one can get an injection and there will be no need for treatment for a couple of months. This is transformative, why? Because if a girl is having sex and is, knows that there are sanctions, family, teachers, is hiding, this is not a person who will take their tablet every day, but they could go quietly and get an injection and be alive for six months, no illness, and go back for another injection. So in terms of effectiveness for certain groups of people who are insecure, who are afraid, who, who fear stigma or sanctions, will benefit from this long acting. But guess what? It's only on the market in rich countries. Where people are and have the disease is Africa, parts of Asia, some of your people here in Eastern Europe. It's not available because some company is still wanting to make billions before they can let it go down in price. We need to change this. Most of these drugs have benefited from public money in research. Also, they are not transparent about their real costs. They have 
recouped profits many years ago, some of them, but are still refusing to give treatment, life-saving treatment to people. We need to change how we incentivize and reward production of medicines. Medicines are not like a pair of shoes, fashion. They are life-saving and they are a right to health for people. So again, I'm saying there's opportunity in the Pandemic Support Treaty to open up for loosening patents during health crisis, but there are also opportunities under World WTO IP rules to revise these and make access to medicines a right and equitable. I want to end because there are many exciting speakers coming. As you can see, the, the key things I am saying that we need to have in place for everyone to enjoy good health are the same. Whether you're fighting HIV AIDS, whether you're fighting malaria, or even cancer, you need these things. Medicines that are priced fairly and provided in health systems that are accessible for all people, rights for everybody, human rights, to be able to freely access what you need, access to financing in a fair global financial market. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam and the Secretary. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Questions will come later on. And now I'm moving to my uh, next uh, intervention. Uh, I'm very proud to give the floor to Madam Najat Mokhtar. She is the Deputy Director General of International Atomic Energy. And uh, of course, uh, we will listen to a very, very important intervention right now. Please, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Today I would like to talk about a subject that is very close to all our hearts. It's the access to care, cancer care, in developing countries, including um, diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And it's really very sad to know that the place where you are born decides on how long you will live. This is, for me, the injustice, because you are in a place where there is no access to imaging, no access to treatment by radiation, you will die. It's just that sentence, and for me, this is something that we all have something to do about it. Um, now, uh, Dr. Winnie has talked about um, subsidies and international uh, finance. And if you know, I don't know if you know, but if you understand that in international financing, only 2%, 2% is dedicated to non communicable disease, which include heart diseases, diabetes, and cancer. So basically, there is no financial support for non-communicable diseases. And which means also that countries, they have to borrow money. And if countries need to borrow money, they have to put cancer treatment in the priority list, which is almost impossible. Now, if we understand that investing in health, it's investing in human capacity, and there are studies that they have shown, Lancet study, that they have shown that if you um, invest in medical imaging and you invest in cancer treatment through radiation, you can save 10 million, 10 million of life from now to 2030. So it's a huge amount in terms of human capability. And yet, globally, 30 countries, they have no medical imaging, no cancer treatment capabilities. No cancer treatment capabilities means in these countries, if you are born there and the person has a cancer, either if they have money, they have to go to another country 
to be treated or just wait and die. This is unacceptable. We at the agency, International Atomic Energy, we have uh, created an initiative called Rays of Hope. And this initiative, the objective is to work with the countries and try to, give, to, to build centers, medical centers, with uh, nuclear medicine, imaging, and cancer treatment. Of course, we don't need only one center in country, we need many, but we start in stages. So with the commitment of the country to build the facility, we always go to donors. We don't have any choice. If you go to bank, you need to have a loan. And we go to donors, other organizations, we work together, and here we're cooperation and partnership with organization, with public and private sector. It's very important to really understand this is a humanitarian cause. This is not a choice. This is going life to other people. And uh, so for the moment, we have 80 countries that they have asked support. Most of them are in Africa. We are starting with the first centers in Malawi, in, uh, in DRC. We are also upgrading centers in Senegal, in, in, uh, other, in many other countries, particularly almost 40 in Africa. And we can see the hope, but it's a lot to do. We have a lot to do at hand, and we can't do it alone. We need everyone, everyone here and outside to spread the word that we need to do something about this situation. Now, if you buy a machine, you need to train health professionals because that machine needs a nurse, need technician, need radiation oncologist, need uh, medical physicist, you need to train these people. And sometimes, training capacity is not available in that country. So you need to go abroad and train these people. Thousands of health professionals need education, need training for in developing worlds. And that's why uh, digital medicine is very important, to give access to these health professionals through digital medicine of education. At the IAEA, we have digital platform, we have courses, 3D animation, virtual courses also that, that gives uh, real immersion for uh, the health professional to be trained. That's very important. Uh, another also aspect is research. Research here help. There is no finance for research. And we know how is important financing research in health. We saw that during COVID-19, research in vaccines saved our life. We know that without research, technology will not evolve. So we need to finance research to find the solution how we can, for example, a linear accelerator can, can, can only cure 100 person per, per month. Or per, so we need to find the solution how we can maybe give access to much more through research, how we can also give access to medical imaging. So a lot to be done, and I call you all uh, to uh, collaborate with us to really help these people outside there that they are waiting for us actually to help them. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we heard two global institutions now, uh, I think it's very important for all of us to listen to the local point of view, the local solutions. And Azerbaijan is a great host, and I'm very proud to give the floor to the Minister of Health, the Republic of Azerbaijan, Mr. Musayev. The floor is ours. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the recent global threats faced by humanity prompt us working closely on fixing the fractured world. Since ensuring security and health for all have become the matters of utmost urgency, I am confident that today's discussions will contribute to strengthening our joint efforts towards achieving the goal that has been popularized by WHO the past 50 years ago. Just imagine 50 years ago, it was quite ambitious goal that by year 2000 will achieve health for all target. 
The emergency situations occurring during the last few years have revealed the fragility of human civilization in front of unforeseen circumstances such as outbreak of infectious diseases, climate change, military conflicts. Better preparedness and adequate strategy require a resilient global health infrastructure. The centuries-old traditional approach to the health care couldn't be reconciled with the demands of the 21st century. Growing number of chronic diseases, shortages of medical professionals, rising cost of treatment and increasing life expectancy create new challenges for the healthcare industry. Technological development in the ICT sector led to bring to reality the dream about health for all by means of accessibility of healthcare services, overcoming the scarcity of human resources. Digitalization of healthcare is a transformation of healthcare not only from a technological side, rather and foremost from a cultural point of view. Digital technologies are taking the doctor-patient relationships to the different level in common decision-making process. It has paved the way for emergence of new health paradigm, shifting from facility-centered to citizen-centered paradigm. This new approach puts people at the center of care. It encourages people to be a part of decision-making process so they get support appropriate for their needs. We're entering a new era of health for all that means active participation of everyone in a responsible way in handling health issues. Health for all definition can be accepted as a fundamental obligation addressed only to governments. Citizens should be encouraged to take active participation in healthy lifestyle programs and share health responsibility with the governments. During the presidency of His Excellency, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, implementation of socially oriented policy, transition to digital government, diversification of economy has continued our current sovereignty and acceptance as a leading country of the region. The reforms carried out are based on the improvement of the social well-being of the citizens of Azerbaijan. For the past 20 years, Azerbaijan has done tremendous work for scaling up the national healthcare system regarding the infrastructure, human capital, and healthcare financing. Over 700 medical facilities have been built and equipped with cutting-edge medical devices. One of the targets of the 2022-2026 Social Economic Development Strategy of the Republic of Azerbaijan approved by presidential decree is to ensure a healthy lifestyle for citizens. Given the fact that there is a relationship between individuals' lifestyle and healthcare costs, individuals' behavior change can work to achieve better health outcomes. Of course, health doesn't exist in isolation. 2024 has been declared Green World Solidarity Year in Azerbaijan. The presidential decree dated December 2023 underscores the Republic of Azerbaijan's role as a reliable and responsible member of the international community, actively contributing to the fight against the consequences of climate change. Despite being an oil-rich country, Azerbaijan is always committed to the green agenda. It's obvious proof hosting COP29 conference in November this year. Our health is closely linked to the environment we live in. Climate change significantly impacts on our health, well-being, and safety. Without timely intervention, it will have catastrophic consequences at personal and global level. It has been clearly stated by His Excellency Director General Dr. Tedros that climate crisis is a health crisis. Governments should be prepared to deal with future climate-related impacts. However, there are several challenges in achieving health for all globally. The burden of disease is changing worldwide. It's estimated that by 2040, 50% of all deaths will be attributable to NCDs. Access to essential medicines is problematic for one-third of all population worldwide. The price of medicines is unaffordable for the least developed countries. 
transfer of new technologies, review of pricing models, overcoming intellectual property obstacles, application of product development partnerships <coughs> could be facilitated access to essential drugs. And controlled and unregulated social media propaganda lead people's health behavior changes during the recent years. Sometimes the viral nature of social media makes it easier to share misinformation very fast. Anti-vax movements, disinformation campaigns, and educated influencers negatively impact public opinion. We all have witnessed the biased and fake propaganda campaigns launched by social media activists during the COVID-19 pandemic. Your Excellencies, distinguished audience. In my country, Health for All concept is particularly important in terms of ensuring safe return of former internally displayed persons to their native lands. Within the Great Return Program, Azerbaijani government is doing a huge work on restoration and rebuilding of the devastated, liberated territories. However, overwhelming contamination of the formerly occupied lands with mines and explosives create impediments to timely implementation of the measures envisaged in the program. Around 350 citizens have become victims of mine explosions since the end of the Second Karabakh War. This is a serious challenge to the healthcare system. The Ministry of Health of the Republic of Azerbaijan, together with the World Health Organization, has started a project of psychological support for the health integration of the population in the liberated territories. Necessary healthcare facilities and services are provided for resettled communities. Staying adherent to the Health for All agenda, access to quality healthcare services will be ensured throughout the whole country. Dear participants, we encourage WHO as a global coordinating health authority to keep setting norms and standards to protect health and well-being of the world population. It's time to develop a global and regional strategy documents to ensure health for all. The health services must be accessible, not to all through primary health care, in which basic medical health should be available in every corner of the country, backed up by referral services to more specialized and sophisticated care. I invite you to initiate new starting for health strategy, health for all and health by everyone. Thank you for your time and your attention. Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. You shared with us the very ambitious goals of uh, the government of Azerbaijan. We wish to you all the success. By the Thank way, you. we'll be very proud if you will be the country that will SDG3 will hit as a champion. Thank you. And as a good example to all the others. Uh, and now I'm turning the floor to a very special lady, President Kulinda Graber Kitarovic. But she was also serving not just as the President of Croatia, but also as Assistant Secretary General uh, of NATO. So, Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, my dear friend, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, today I am actually speaking in my capacity of co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which is a high-level board that has been co-convened by uh, the World Health Organization and by the World Bank uh, to provide high-level advocacy and monitoring of preparedness for pandemics and health emer emergencies. And I honestly must admit that um, among the things that I do right now when I focus on security, on geopolitics, etc., pandemic preparedness has been, become one of the more discouraging, um, maybe even frustrating aspects of, of the work that I do. Um, we as the global community tend to shift our focus from one issue to another very quickly. So with the beginning with uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the pandemic of COVID-19 was suddenly over, at least in our minds, uh, and at least in what we started focusing on uh, and working on. Yet, it is a very dangerous notion. 
because uh, of course viruses remain out there. There will be new ones, 75 of uh, uh, the viruses who cause epidemics and pandemics, uh, pandemics are actually zoonotic in nature, so they are transferred from animals to humans. Uh, and uh, um, having in mind the combination of climate change, migration, and other aspects, other challenges from the geopolitical environment, the next pandemic is not uh, an issue of if, but an issue of when. So what I don't want to happen is for us to wake up one morning and get a four o'clock in the morning call and saying, okay, we have a new potential pandemic, a new virus causing a potential uh, pandemic, because we tend to go through these cycles of panic and neglect. And now, unfortunately, we are in the cycle of neglect, which will lead to panic if we don't get our act together. Right now, there are ongoing negotiations in Geneva led by the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body on the Pandemic Accord. And uh, the negotiations, unfortunately, are not proceeding that well due to many considerations. Of course, any international accord, especially in the context of an organization that is as big as the United Nations, often comes down to the lowest common denominator that countries can agree on. But so many issues are coming in the way of this treaty, such as sovereignty, such as ideological divides and, and geopolitical divides and rifts that are actually very detrimental to the future of humanity and to the future of uh, the healthcare system and uh, what uh, Wendy said earlier, the basic human right, healthcare, health, and access to healthcare for all. So, well, uh, the, the major problems uh, right now being uh, resistance by countries, first of all, to talk about equity, and I think that everybody um, so far has talked about um, equity, equity of access to healthcare, to medical countermeasures, therapeutics, uh, and uh, uh, to many other areas that are compounded uh, in uh, the cases of pandemics and then pandemics reveal. And the second um, con uh, very uh, uh, um, contentious issue is independent monitoring. There is monitoring that is done, self-assessment by countries themselves. And we all know, we've been in government, that when we produce a report, we tend to focus on the good things that we've done and leave out those that we could have done better. Then there is peer monitoring and peer reporting, and there is independent monitoring, which is actually crucial to determine the weaknesses in the systems to work towards not just pandemic and health emergencies prevention, but uh, building robust healthcare systems and building the entire system around the healthcare system that will be able to support the pandemic. Because the pandemics not only revealed the weaknesses of healthcare. You know, if I look at Croatia, for instance, and if we know that COVID-19 mostly affected people with comorbidities, and we were one of the countries with the highest per capita rate of death from COVID-19, that it really makes me think what is wrong about our healthcare system. Are people not informed? Um, is preventive care not working to determine diabetes, um, high blood pressure, um, and treat people uh, in the right kind of manner? Or was our response to treating, to providing therapeutics uh, and other countermeasures not uh, sufficient? So for me, that would be something, uh, a lesson learned to build a, a better, a more sound healthcare system uh, that allows for a more quality life. Another aspect that we've seen is socioeconomic divides within societies, across societies, lack of solidarity. We've seen nationalism, we've seen um, stockpiling of um, vaccine, etc. But the socioeconomic divide really worries me 
Uh, it's also connected to the digital divide. And we've seen that it has affected the most vulnerable um, parts of society and most of all women. Women who were exposed as first responders in pandemics and were often not protected. And second, women who uh, ended up the ones who were losing jobs, who had to take care of their families, of their children. And when it comes to the digital devices, in order to be able to continue working or online or uh, school, it very much depended on the quality of the internet, on the, the quality of digital devices, and also the number of devices within families. And again, boys and men were always preferred in that sense. The rise in domestic violence, mental health care, we've forgotten about all of this. And we need to continue talking about it and really be ready for the next pandemic in order uh, to be prepared. So uh, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board issued um, our last report last year, towards the end of last year in 2023. It's called the Fragile State of Preparedness. So obviously we were very far from where we want to be. And uh, based on the report, we issued four key recommendations. The first one is to improve our monitoring system. So to invest into data collection at the country, regional and global levels, involving various sectors, not just of government, so not just the healthcare ministry, but other uh, ministries and departments as well, but also civil um, sector as well. Um, as a captain who navigates a ship needs the proper tools to navigate within uh, murky or icy waters, so do we need the proper tools in order to navigate uh, areas such as pandemics when there are so many unknowns. So building those proper tools is crucial. Second, in strengthening the global pan uh, uh, pandemic or global financing system. And it does not only refer to the pandemic fund, which is far from being uh, um, full in terms of the money that we have dedicated and collected, it also means improving domestic financing, which for those countries that still cannot afford to invest a lot of, into healthcare because they have uh, national, high national debt, etc., means that we need to work around these issues to make it possible for, for countries to invest into their own healthcare systems as we cannot continue to rely solely on the overseas uh, development assistance, which is shifting with shifting geopolitical <laughs> challenges and priorities as we see them. Um, the third uh, aspect is enhanced equity and access to medical countermeasures, again, within societies and among societies. And we've seen that uh, particularly in certain countries, uh, we were very late in uh, um, distributing vaccines, etc. So the um, way out is to build regional systems of research and development. Currently, about 80% of global research and development is focused only in about 10 countries. So building research and, and development facilities, but also production and distribution uh, capabilities in uh, different regions is crucial. And fourth, enhance multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder collaboration. Again, this isn't just about governments and governments imposing or dealing uh, with what happens. Uh, the um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, really uh, emphasized the stopping the spread of uh, the epidemic from diseases um, in terms of requiring a comprehensive whole of society approach. And I think that Mr. Minister mentioned um, information and digitalization. So digital tools are very important to distribute information to monitor uh, people's health at uh, distance, not just telemedicine, but personal devices. But what we also have to, have to be very careful about is the so-called infodemics. When people use social media to distribute content that is not accurate, 
and that confuses people and actually moves them away from taking care of their own health. So in closing, I just would like to really thank the NGIC for the support and partnering with the World Health Organization and with the GPMB, one of the few organizations who's really dedicated to health for all and healthcare for all. Um, and I hope that we do continue in that sense and that the NGIC provides support for all of us to bring about that pandemic accord and get the global community ready for the next pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, super interesting. As I listened to you, as you had a lot of interesting ideas, linking them to security, because you understand security as very few others, I was telling myself, uh, well, we all quote President Bill Clinton by saying it's economy stupid. No, no, no. We are living in another world and now it's security stupid, including health security. Now I'm moving to another very powerful and wise woman. I'm very proud to give the floor to Madam Mushira Hatab. She served as a Minister of Population of a very exciting country, Egypt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for the uh, Nizami Ganjavi Center for organizing such a great conversation. Uh, actually, I've benefited a lot from the very precious intervention of the panelists. And uh, the, the, this session is very important because it's about people. It's about humans. It's about street people, most vulnerable people. Madame Wini spoke about HIV and AIDS and how to provide uh, medication, and she wants to provide this free of charge. Uh, the question is whether states can really afford. If not, what can they do, or what are they supposed to do? And this brings us to the intervention yesterday by the Director General of the WHO when uh, he linked the right to health to international peace and security, and this is very correct. So the question that was put to us early this morning in the first session was about what is one thing to do to fix a fractured world. And we heard, uh, bring people to the center stage. Uh, Madame uh, Bokova spoke about the right to education, and she focused on the girl child. Listening to all of this brings this, conversa this conversation to, I want to bring it to an empirical level where we really have a very easy option available for us to put people at the center stage, but in which capacity? Are they begging for treatment? No, we bring them to center stage as right holders. So the human rights approach elevates the status of the most vulnerable of human beings. The human rights approach puts a legal obligation on states to honor the protection, promotion, and provision of human rights to every human being under its jurisdiction. And again, with COVID, and we're not yet over with COVID, and yesterday, Mr. Tedros reminded us that the question about the next pandemic is not if it will happen, but when it happens. So we have to comprehend very well lessons learned because COVID has revealed very ugly disparities, extremely. I mean, if I pick up on what Madame Bokova spoke about education, the school lockdown uh, for children coming for rich from uh, 
uh, well-to-do households, there was no problem. They had the internet and they were connected to schools and they continued their education, no problem. But for poorer and marginalized, deprived children, they stayed home in very run-down households, very crowded, everybody at home with no internet and they lost connection to school. School does not only provide education, but it provides protection from diseases, it provides early uh, detection, it provides special protection from violence and abuse. So COVID is, and uh, going back to school started, but some children never went back to school. Some girls got pregnant, some boys were driven into the labor market where they were sexually abused. So the lesson we learn from this is human rights. And we have everything in place to have a strong system to kick head on because uh, we have, I can say, for instance, for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, every single country has ratified the convention and states have accepted voluntarily the legal obligation to provide human rights in its entirety. Right to education, right to health, right to freedom of expression, right to uh, decent housing, right to family environment. Everything is provided that the state took upon itself the responsibility to provide this comprehensive set of human rights. So now is the time to push for the human rights approach and no less than that. If we want to provide free uh, remedies from HIV and AIDS, uh, states under the human rights system are obliged to allocate from their national resources as much as possible. And through international cooperation, where available. And international cooperation is a, a commitment and obligation on rich and on the less rich. Uh, because poverty is not only about financial income, but poverty is multidimensional. Deprivation of education is poverty. Deprivation of health care is poverty. And to be able to do this, uh, we have a viable human rights system, viable set of conventions on each and every human rights, and under this, states have the commitment to uh, promulgate legislation to fill the gaps. They have the obligation to put an action plan with time frame. They have the obligation to put in place a disaggregated data system. This disaggregated data system reveals the disparities and enables for spotting and targeting the most needy. And states have the obligation, or they have undertaken upon themselves the obligation to work in partnership with the civil society, transparent and viable partnership, starting by joint planning, joint implementation, and joint monitoring and evaluation. I add my voice to uh, what was said about the monitoring and evaluation. It has to be honest, impartial, and this is how you can correct any uh, wrong, uh, any wrong move. And through this uh, progressive realization of human rights, we can fix a fractured world. For economic and social and cultural rights, states are committed to allow progressive uh, resources because they cannot build schools for everybody every night. They, ca uh, they cannot build uh, 
hospitals uh, for everybody, but they have to show that there is development, progression, and there has to be uh, impartial evaluation. And we have a very viable system working, which is the monitoring uh, or the treaty bodies, where states have not only accepted to implement, but to be monitored on their implementation through reports that they periodically present to the treaty bodies and they receive recommendations and they work on the recommendations. So I think we have to uh, treat everybody as equal without any discrimination whatsoever, be it to gender, religion, ethnic background, ability, disability, HIV and AIDS, or no HIV and AIDS, LGBTQ, whatever, no discrimination on any basis whatsoever. Only then, only then, we can ensure that we have a viable system that you can monitor, yes. and you can fix a fractured world uh, based on this uh, uh, human rights. I stop there, maybe come later for recommendations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, madam. Very strong, very wise words. And of course, you make a very, very clear point about it is all linked at the end to, to human rights and to an inclusive approach. Everyone should and has to work together. Uh, and uh, it's not just about institutions, it's just about civil society, all of us together. Now I have two last but very important uh, speakers on the panel. Uh, they are men, they have a very sharp minds. They all served as prime ministers, but also today they are world known with the analytics. They write a lot, they do a lot, they study. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I'm giving the floor for somebody I follow very, uh, in a very exciting way, I follow his analysis, and that's uh, the Prime Minister Domart Otorbaev. She served as a Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan. She, he's very active, uh, and now I'm very happy to give you the floor, my dear friend. Uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I cannot stop myself from congratulating Nizami Ganjavi International Center and the board of NGIC for organizing another excellent, outstanding forum. So we have old friends here, we have new people, which is always enhancing our understanding and knowledge. Very important that uh, recently NGIC established line of business with World Health Organization. And uh, my main statement today will be that we have to continue this work together because we live in echoing the name of the forum, the fixing this super fractured world in healthcare. Uh, let me give you just a couple of numbers and then make comments about why I think that we are in a super fractured world in healthcare. Uh, 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 most of my uh, predecessors in the panel mentioned COVID-19. It was a major earthquake which put all planet on its knees and ignited unprecedented panic, which humanity never faced before. Uh, if you look to the numbers, numbers are quite shocking. Uh, in 2020, there were registration of 1.8 million deaths based on COVID. But if you look to the numbers which humanity voluntarily spent for shutting up and fighting with COVID, it's absolutely incredible numbers. Humanity voluntarily sacrificed between 15 and 20 trillion dollars in shutting down our economies, in making lockdowns, introducing different measures. So it's enormous numbers. This is how humanity get united around this very bad disease. But there is another disease 
which is not less deadly than COVID-19, which killing last 12 years, 18, 8 million people every year between 1.2 to 1.9 million, which is tuberculosis. It's killing every year at least 1.2 million people. How to fix tuberculosis? Calculations of WTO show that we need to dedicate one, 13 billion dollars, one three billion dollars, to prevent, diagnose, treatment, and care to achieve some issues in fixing this disease. Question: Why we are not doing it? It's thousand times less than we spend for COVID. One thousand times. It's something like four hours of which we spend during COVID times, we could spend annual to fight tuberculosis and the situation will be fixed. 1,000 times. So we are living in unfair world. We know all of, everything about that. But the numbers which I showed show that it's absolutely horrendous unfairness. And the reason I conclude, the reason why we spend 1,000 times more money for COVID in, in comparison with fighting tuberculosis. Very simple. The question is that COVID attacked rich countries. That's it. This is not fair. We have to increase awareness that with a very little amount of money, humanity can get rid of this infection disease, which killing every day hundreds and thousands of people. So to fix super unfractured world in healthcare, I think that we can focus in the many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister, very, very strong point. We will never forget that. So, now my last but not least very important speaker is the Prime Minister of Moldova, Cirio Gaburici. Cirio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. I am, first of all, I would like also to thank Nizami Gijevi International Center for this great organization, for this high representative uh, forum. And I'm happy to share from my experiences, even if we are talking about healthcare, I can share my experience as an, an observer. Uh, and it's very important to have these discussions because they, first of all, they are preventing us from falling the trap of um, routine and falling the trap of inertia. But at the same time, they are uh, giving us uh, a message that there are some changes that depends only on us. And when I'm saying on us, I talk about each of us individual and all of us collectively. To solve all these problems, I think we need to look a little bit uh, from the helicopter view, uh, big to, see, to be able to see the big, uh, the big picture, and that's because the, everything in this world is so much complex, first of all, and second, is so much interconnected that you touch here and you feel there. So it, it, it is like that, and we saw it uh, many, many times. In this regard, they have an, um, or I would like to start with an optimistic observation that today the humanity, I think, have all the necessary resources to solve the vital issues such as global warming, environmental pollution, health care that we are talking uh, today, providing access to education to those kids where they do not have, and providing food to those that don't have access to it at the moment. We managed to construct the economic uh, model of the world in such a way that it generates, it generates enough resources and we have today access to the great technologies that can help us to develop even further. We just need to learn two things, to learn two things. First, uh, these are simple things but very complicated at the same time. First is to set up 
proper priorities. And these priorities should be able to take into consideration the opinion and the, the, the position of the majority, I would say the majority of the people. And second, we need to build up an honest and respectful global dialogue where we seek compromises that unites us. It's very important that these things we need to learn. You were mentioning today about the COVID-19. I think this pandemic, um, pandemic demonstrated us first how fragile the global dialogue is and how much progress we still can have among ourselves to, to, to have that global uh, focused dialogue because this should be based on our cooperation among us and this should be based on the trust between us. At the same time, in some part of the world, millions of vaccines doses were unused and went expired, while in another part of the world, people were missing them. And we, that resulted with uh, uh, the loss of uh, tens of thousands of, or hundreds even thousands of lives. And this is happening in the time when we have technology and this issue can be solved within seconds with a simple, I don't know, mathematical modeling and that should be deciding how and when to, to, to react. It is still challenging for all of us to find, to allocate a few hundreds of millions of dollars to enhance the medical services and ensure the healthcare accessibility where this is needed and it's very, or it's easier to get hundreds of billion in order to buy weapons or military equipment. And we know that this, at the later stage, will potentially have an impact on the lives of millions. The economical um, and social inequality, it's not just an observation. This is a vehicle that moves the migration and also increase in some of the regions the social tension. There are, because of this, there are companies which are getting very rich over the nights uh, with the access to the technology and the technology and financial situation e normally uh, will give to these people or company or group of people a lot of power, it's up to us, humanity, to decide how do we use that power for good or for harm. We were mentioning today about the climate change, we were mentioning today about the air, soil, water pollution, we were mentioning today about economical and social inequality, also about the uh, healthcare, but also I would like to mention about all these uh, military conflicts that we have. And I think this indicates very clear that we have not learned to use the accumulated power wisely. We are still, in some of the cases, more destroyer than builders or constructors. I think it's time for the humanity to rethink the current governance models that uh, in order to be better connected to the real needs of the big majority. I am convinced that conflicts and uh, competition for power, which consume many of our resources, are the results of political or politicians' activities. I am confident that today, if we will take a doctor or the doctors from, uh, I don't know, Germany, France, USA, Azerbaijan, Moldova, India, Russia, wherever, they will not struggle for power, but they will find common themes and topics that they will discuss and they will get well during, among themselves during these discussions. And these discussions, believe me, will be important for the humanity. I'm sure that the same happens with teachers, with farmers and with all other uh, specialists or specialities. They would easier understand each other uh, very well. Most of the problems that we are living today that are threatening the, the humanity are uh, generated by the political elites, including the acute deficit of quality of the health care services that we are talking uh, today. 
I think in order to re, uh, re or, or re recreate the, 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 uh, the, the situation of the political interfering to, to, to the world, maybe should be some restrictions awarded to the politicians that can decide. So to understand that certain decisions should be taken only by the communities. When I was saying uh, uh, to reset this, I think we have to do that with the existing resources that we have enough that I was mentioning before, and with the access to the, to the technologies. In conclusion, I think redefining the priorities for humanity and setting up a clear task to commit to a future where everyone has access to essential health care, it's, it's doable and that can be done through collaboration, through empathy, through innovative governance. Like this we can build, in my opinion, and ensure a well-being for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, my dear panelists. Uh, you spoke wisely. You were very disciplined. So we are on time. We have 20 more minutes to go. We're now we're starting probably a very exciting part of our panel because we're here to serve our audience. So I'm turning to the audience. You're free to ask questions. Ladies first. And you will be next. Probably we can collect two, three questions uh, and then our our panelists will answer the question. Thank you very much. My name is Farida Allagi. I'm from Libya. Thank you for, to all the speakers. The question that I want to raise, it's not a question, it's a comment. Is health for all? Health is not for all at all. And we know that very, very well. I happen to be involved since the 80s with many international agencies through an international development fund, and we were funding many UN organizations in the health, in the education, the women, in all these fields. And I have to be very honest and frank and bold. Sadly enough, many of these UN agencies and other agencies and ministries, and sometimes even universities, are not saying the truth about the reality. And I had an experience, a personal experience with infant mortality in the Arab world. Each UN agency, World Bank, WHO, UNICEF, name it, gives a statistic, a number. And we know very well how many governments are playing with statistics. Because many governments, they don't want to say the right statistic, let's say, of infant mortality, if they are really, you know, doing the business. The word that I want to indicate and, and, and to focus on, corruption is connected with health is not for all. Thousands and hundreds of proven facts that many governments are up to here with corruption and the money that should go to health, to children, to AIDS, to drug prevention that I happen to work in this field for the last 25 years, and it's not changing, okay? It is due to corruption. The money goes to the pocket of the politician or their relatives, and they never admit to that. And also, I have to say, we can no longer continue to express our wishes for health for all. We have to put the question, why for 20, 30 years, health is not for all yet? Why, why? Like many, many other uh, uh, questions. The UN is failing us. We cannot keep repeating about the agony, about the poverty, about the injustices. About... No, but what has been achieved? Why it has not been achieved up to now? And nowadays, the money that has been going a little bit to fund some research or some data, which is all wrong, is going to arms. And I have to conclude, yes, health is connected to peace and security, 
and the bombing that has been going on in Gaza to the hospitals and the suffering of the women and the children, that's a very vivid example that under no circumstances we can postpone not to talk about today's reality, injustices, war, and what we are witnessing in Gaza, and not to talk about it with honesty and openness. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. I'm sure some of my panelists will respond to that. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, panelists. Uh, in particular, uh, your presentation is absolutely fantastic. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention a point just came out about an hour ago on, uh, on the news, and that is the fact that uh, neurological disorders now, 3.4 billion people worldwide are living with neurological disorders. That's 40% of the uh, global population. But by extension, there are one billion people around the world, mostly youth, who have mental health issues and challenges. I cannot imagine there is any other more important issue than this issue to be declared a pandemic, mental health disorders pandemic. This is the only way we can bring international resources together, we can bring government together, but sadly, as the speakers have mentioned, it takes a uh, member state in order to make the request through the World Health Organization so the World Health Organization can declare uh, mental health as a pandemic. I appeal to you, in particular to our Minister of Health, who very eloquently uh, stated the point, to make that request through the non-aligned movement to the World Health Organization the World Health Organization already have stated that uh, mental health is in a crisis, but frankly, no, it's more than a crisis, it's pandemic. The reasons why it's more than a crisis because it affects our youth disproportionately, and more than that, in low-income countries and least developed countries, it's far more difficult. And also, as well as even in other countries, we still don't want to talk about mental health. So in a lot of the statistics that probably if everybody was to talk about mental health, we will see more than one billion. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting point. So depression, anxiety is a global pandemics. But we get the answers right now. If somebody else is willing to say something, please, young leaders we have here, please. The young lady here on the first row. Um, yeah, hello. Thank you so much for such a good discussion. Uh, I'm Clau. I'm one of the young global leaders, and I'm also a co founder of a global health nonprofit. So I work in northern Nigeria on providing sexual reproductive health access in marginalized and underserved communities. I was very excited to hear that so many of you mentioned digital health, because I do believe that this is the future of, of health. But one thing that I can see over and over in my work is that this is going to create digital exclusion and digital divide. For example, one of the programs I was recently working on was on creating an AI-enabled chatbot of reproductive and sexual health that could be provided for women living in remote and hard-to-reach communities. However, they don't have phones. A lot of them are illiterate. They don't write. They don't read. So they will be excluded. They will be left behind through all of those innovations. So I would love to hear your thoughts about what can, be, what can we do to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind while as our digital health is, is going forward. Thank you. Great point. Young and a very wise leader. OK, somebody else from the auditorium? If somebody wants to ask the question, have an opinion, right now is the point, the moment. If not, we have 10 more minutes to go. So I'm turning to my podium. Of course, I'm starting. Okay, with Madam Minister from Egypt, you have all of you, my dear panelists, because, one and a half minutes. Please. Because I'm not United Nations, I can defend the United Nations. <laughs> and I, sell, I tell Dr. Farid al alaki uh, the United Nations is uh, a contributing or an assistive agency, but the obligation is on the states. And the states have uh, voluntarily committed themselves to the SDGs, 
to a number of human rights uh, uh, conventions, and states go and report to treaty bodies, the Committee uh, uh, Against uh, Discrimination Against Women, Convention on the Rights of the Child, People with Disabilities, Enforced Disappearance. They have to say what have they done to honor their own commitments. And the United Nations cannot force itself on any member states. The, I can ask the UN to help me as a state, but the United Nations cannot force itself on me. Having said that, I want to give you some examples of the uh, progress achieved. Look at the infant and under five mortality rates. <clears throat> it has declined. Some diseases were killers. Now they take vaccines. And no, there has been a big leap jump in fighting diseases, in improving the services, and also international cooperation and providing more resources. And I have to say that always the initiative to offer contribution comes from the rich countries. Rarely a poorer country would go and ask a, a, a donor country. It's the other way around, which gives you a, a feeling on the sense of uh, commitment. There is more commitment now to human rights. Of course, there are huge violations of human rights. And we see the plight of the Palestinian children. We see hospitals destroyed, schools destroyed. destroyed. This is utter violation of the human rights of vulnerable children. Uh, we talk about the human rights uh, law and the international humanitarian law and the protection of civilians under the Geneva Convention to protect civilians. This is all, uh, it's, 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 it's a sad story. And again, again, we have seen the submission of South Africa against the occupying power before the International Court of Justice, great submissions, and it was all about human rights. Uh, in the um, panel, Mr. Amr Musa and uh, Madame uh, Tsepi Levni, she, she said that Israel is a democratic country, but as a matter of fact, Israel is taking to the International Court of Justice uh, because of huge violations of human rights. And human rights and democracy is two sides of of one coins, it's about the rule of law. So we still have a lot of injustices. But when you go and flag human rights before the International Court of Justice, it shows that at least only through human rights you can bring people to justice. And the, 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 the events in Palestine, the war on the Palestinian people, has dealt a blow to the nascent movement of human rights in the Middle East. I've been working on human rights for 20 years. It was so difficult to criminalize FGM in 2003. Now, easily, you can double the penalty. You can make it a, a hardcore crime uh, rather than a, a felony. There is progress. Mental health, I like the question about mental health. Yes, the right to health has two components. Number one, the right of each human being to enjoy the best possible state of health. And the other side of the human right to health is the right to access the best available uh, health services. Of course, in a developing country, or in a poorer countries, the quality of health services is compromised. And mental health does not receive the same attention. It is costly, but it's more and more under the spotlight. So I really like to accentuate the progress and build on it, rather than discourage those who work hard. We still have many injustices, but we're working very hard. And I salute the United Nations. Thank you, Madam. Great. Uh, Madam Undersecretary General of the United Nations, you would be willing probably to address the issues in your final words. 
Well, I think my colleague has said it for Great us. Answer. Um, for me, this is a social contract. People, citizens are in their country, working, paying their taxes, mothers having children, raising a future labor force, and their governments also give back to them, give them health care when they need it, education for their children, roads, safety, protection from violence. There's a deal there, a social contract. But increasingly we see uh, a neoliberal idea to take responsibility away from the state to give people the duties to deliver for their countries, but without the benefits from the state, increasingly to seek and buy it from the private sector. I don't buy that model. And the UN, my sister has put it well, we set norms, we set standards, we get governments to agree on what to deliver and we track, we monitor, we urge them, we give technical capacity if they need it. But that's the role, it's an accompanying role. It is not a role to deliver on the rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Madam Mokhtar, final words, thank you. Thank you, just on the digitalization part, indeed there are some you know, difficulties to access in the case of the women you have mentioned, but I see digital health as a, an opportunity, for example, for health workers in remote areas to be able to give also health services to these women. There is also the possibility in digitalization to have data so that we can monitor diseases like zoonotic diseases. So it has a lot of uh, benefit like education for those health workers in Africa in remote areas so they can have access to education and training through digitalization. It has a lot of benefit, but of course, access is not to, to everyone. Of course, th those are specific cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Madam President, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Just to follow on, of course, there is huge potential for digital to, to assist in telemedicine, in uh, uh, remote monitoring devices with individual patients' health. Um, however, yes, there is the digital divide, and I'm afraid we don't have an exact answer to that. What would be pertinent is what I talked about, and that is strengthening the global financing system, not just when it comes to international funding, but help individual countries to be able to invest into the sectors that are crucial uh, for them through uh, debt refinancing uh, and management, etc., so that uh, low-income countries are not forced to just pay off debts, but that they're able to invest into their communities as well. And just a final word on the data and the statistics. WHO and other organizations uh, publish data that they get from national governments, and this is precisely why GPMB is um, advocating for independent monitoring. And this isn't about trying to interfere with someone's sovereignty. This isn't about trying to um, play a naming and shaming game and shifting blame on one country or another. This is really about getting the most accurate data that we can so that we can build robust healthcare systems, not just for uh, pandemics and healthcare emergencies, but first and foremost for the prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Minister of Health of Azerbaijan, you Thank are you. Thank now you. with the final and closing remarks. Thank you for giving the opportunity to answer. I would like to answer to the questions regarding the mental health, actually. Uh, the world is changing, of course, and uh, unfortunately, ICT advances just conquering the world and our life and uh, they riding us, rather we are riding them. So this is why the first point we should start with is uh, digital hygiene action. Unfortunately, this is a question that should be approached through proved scientific approach, and this is new field that is growing right now, and I hope the next generations will avoid 
all the obstacles and problems we faced with, and generational approach is absolutely proven in this case. Another question that the question of uh, health for all is such, such a wide topic that we can interfere this subject with all aspects of our lives. And if we want to start to fix fractured world, we should see the root of that fractures. The root is always in education. So we should start from proper health education first. So each schoolboy and schoolgirls will be aware what does health means for them. And then when they grow up, they will fix the fractured world. We, unfortunately, living to them. Thank you. Well, now it's time, dear friends, to have a big round of applause for our panelists. Sharp 90 minutes and coffee is waiting for you. Thank you. Big thank you for the moderator. Excellent moderation. Hakan Fidan, the new Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey. Hello, welcome, please. So dear friends, colleagues, I think it is fair to say that until now the discussions of the uh, Baku Forum, the 11th edition of the Baku Forum, have uh, been oriented on climate change issues and also on security issues. And so I think for this afternoon we have a debate coming on the role of regional economic and military organizations, but before that we have uh, the privilege and the honor to host Mr. Hakan Fidan, the new minister, I still can say, the new minister of foreign affairs of Turkey since June 2023. And I would like to briefly sketch your career until now. Graduated at the Turkish Military Academy. You obtained bachelor degrees in, uh, at the University of Maryland College in the States. You then obtained a master's and doctoral degree from the Department of International Relations at the Bilkent University in Ankara, if I'm well informed served as a president of the Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency, deputy undersecretary responsible for foreign policy and security issues at the Prime Ministry, board member of the International Atomic Energy Agency, special representative of the Prime Minister, deputy undersecretary of the National Intelligence Organization, undersecretary director of the National Intelligence Organization, and special representative of the president. And you were also uh, in 2010 and you served in that position for, for, for 13 years. You were appointed then as the Undersecretary Director of the National Intelligence Organization of Turkey. Just to mention that uh, we not only have a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, but we also have a very seasoned and experienced specialist of uh, intelligence and security issues. So, Mr. Minister, we are looking forward to uh, listen to you. For the order, we will listen to the minister, then we will have Q&A, including some questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. You have the floor. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Excellencies, dear participants, it is a distinct pleasure to be in Azerbaijan to attend the 11th Global Baku Forum. I wholeheartedly thank the Nizami Genjevi International Center for this kind invitation. Since its inception, Forum has helped establish Baku as a center of diplomacy. It did so by providing regional perspectives from South Caucasus on global affairs. As you know, we organized the third Antalya Diplomacy Forum, ADF, on <clears throat> earlier this month, fostering a regional outlook and thinking outside the box of established narratives are also among the key objectives of the ADF. Dear friends, we stand on the brink of a drastic transformation within the global system. That is why crises, conflicts, and wars have escalated to unprecedented levels. In such times, international community expects the so-called rules-based international system to deliver fair and effective solutions to outstanding challenges. Unfortunately, today, neither the international system nor the major actors behind it are delivering these solutions. Instead, the hegemonic powers are pursuing their own agendas. 
Moreover, it is evident that no one can independently address the geostrategic challenges at hand. Therefore, solutions based on regional ownership stand out as the most viable path forward. Let us start with the South Caucasus. Azerbaijan had to wait several decades for the Minsk group to, to end the Armenian occupation of Karabakh. The Minsk group has chosen a strategy to prolong the occupation rather than ending it, despite several UN Security Council resolutions. Following Second Karabakh War and the anti-terror operation, justice has finally been served. Right after the Second Karabakh War in 2020, President Erdogan and President Aliyev made a very visionary call for peace by proposing a regional mechanism of six states, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia, Iran, and Georgia. This proposal was built on the premise that the countries of our region, not outsiders, can pave the way for genuine peace and stability. The 3 plus 3 platform, as it is called today, was quickly established and already held two meetings. Our doors also open to our Georgian friends whose position we truly understand. We will host the third one in Turkey this year. This region-grown initiative is remarkable for having brought two sides and regional actors to the same table. One should also mention that the quick embrace of this initiative was also possible due to already existing regional platforms. Turkey takes pride in leading these trilateral and quadrilateral processes, which have been very fruitful for regional cooperation. In fact, just this morning, we held the ninth trilateral foreign ministers meeting between Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. The Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization, too, has been vital in generating a culture of working together in a wider geography. Thanks to these efforts, Azerbaijan and Armenia are now very close to a comprehensive peace treaty. I must note that while we strive for peace, there are some who still cling to old habits. I am referring to certain Western countries, which take unilateral actions primarily for domestic political consumptions. Also biased acts like those taken at the Council of Europe against Azerbaijan. There is a historic window of opportunity for peace in South Caucasus. Our call to all countries is to encourage, not to spoil, the negotiations for a peaceful settlement. Distinguished guests, such a negotiated solution is direly needed in the war in Ukraine. Turkey has held a principled position since the beginning of the war. We support Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity, including Crimea in political and practical terms. While doing so, we also give diplomacy a chance and exert efforts to mitigate the repercussions of the war. Regional ownership has been guiding us in this pursuit. The Black Sea Initiative was a prime example in developing regional solutions to regional impasses with global ramifications. The Mine Countermeasure Task Force is yet another recent regional initiative. Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania, as three littoral NATO allies, will contribute to maritime and energy security in the Black Sea. There is also a clear need for a new arrangement in the Black Sea to ensure the safety of commercial navigation. Such a new mechanism must be based on new facts on the ground. It should also enjoy the support of both Ukraine and Russia. We understand that both countries favor exploring the possibility of a new security framework. I can say that an agreement seems to be reachable. This new mechanism will contribute to global food security as well as the escalation in the Black Sea. Distinguished participants, the war in Ukraine is in its third year, yet we do not see it ending soon. The immense loss of lives on both sides and physical damage caused by the conflict have brought about a stalemate. Given the exponential attritional impact of the war, neither sides nor our world can afford a forever war. In view of the growing complexities of the war, there is a clear need to create room for diplomacy. 
Calling for negotiations is not asking Ukraine to submit or surrender. It is just a call for speeding up the inevitable, which is finding a solution around the table. Prolongation of the war will also further erode stability in our region and beyond. Reaching a negotiated settlement based on safeguarding Ukraine's legitimate interests still constitutes a priority. However, this doesn't mean recognition of the occupation. In order to stop this war, which is taking place during the 21st century on the European continent, it is high time to decouple the issues of sovereignty from a ceasefire. Dear friends, last October I told my OIC colleagues that member states should take the matter <coughs> into your, on their hands this time, instead of waiting for others to solve its own problems. Otherwise, Israel will simply make us forget this atrocity to simply make us forget this atrocity too, too by committing another even more brutal one. The contact group established by the extraordinary summit of the OIC and Arab League displayed an act of regional ownership. As seven countries, we were mandated to act on behalf of the Muslim world and intervene the ongoing tragedy in Palestine. Thanks to the group's effort, an overwhelming majority of the international community is now in favor of an immediate ceasefire, unhindered humanitarian relief, and the two-state solution. Yet our intensive diplomatic efforts have not stopped Israel's war crimes in Gaza. Unfortunately, we have more than 31,000 martyrs as of today, most of them women, children, and elderly. Gaza is now raised to the ground and largely inhabitable. The so-called Maritime Corridor, we are an entity acted as a logistical hub to supply Israel's military campaign with weapons and ammunition is yet another aid washing exercise. It serves to the interests of Israel and its supporters for blockading the humanitarian supplies from Rafah crossings. Therefore, it is our duty to honor the sacrifices and unspeakable agony that the Palestinians had to endure. This will not be served until we materialize the two-state solution based on pre-1967 borders and with full-fledged Palestinian statehood. In the past, reaching a final settlement has not been possible due to Israel's lack of commitment to the two-state vision. Therefore, this time we came up with the proposal of guarantorship mechanism. Our idea is that with such a mechanism based on regional ownership, major regional countries and international actors would assume responsibility to monitor, verify, and when needed, enforce the obligations of the parties as a part of the final agreement. Our proposal along these lines has been well received by our regional and international interlocutors. Turkey will remain ready to take such responsibility in this regard. Dear friends, Turkey's outlook on regional ownership is not limited with these three major international conflicts. As for the Syrian crisis, Turkey is among guarantor states of the Astana platform that aims to provide the calm on the ground and elaborate the ways to advance political process. Turkey aims to nurture regional ownership through contacts at highest levels for achieving a sustainable political solution in Libya too based on stability, territorial integrity, and unity. Furthering the process for free, fair, and credible elections on a consensual basis is a strategic imperative in this sense. As far as the Balkans is concerned, the region goes through another chapter of volatile regional dynamics, aggravated by global de developments. Turkey led home ground regional initiatives, such as the Southeast Europe countries cooperation process and trilateral mechanisms gained on greater importance. Dear friends, while Asia is returning to the center of geopolitics, we are institutionalizing our bonds with our historical homeland. The Organization for Turkic States today stands as a full-fledged international organization. It is constantly expanding integration and cooperation in several fields. Finally, Turkey's regional ownership policies also encompasses energy and connectivity projects. 
We support initiatives such as TANAP, TAP, Trans-Caspian, East-West Middle Corridor, and the Development Road Project of Iraq. Recent international developments certified once again that any connectivity plan that excludes Turkey and our region is doomed to fail. In any case, we follow our region's strategic priorities rather than those imposed by global hegemonic powers. Dear friends, there are many other more issues that can be raised in terms of regional ownership, but let me stop here for the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, before uh, giving the floor to colleagues in, in the room. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your uh, address. Um, if I may ask you two questions. The first one, coming back to uh, our hosting nation, more specifically on the, uh, the very important task Azerbaijan has in the later this year as the hosting country for the uh, COP29 meeting. We have had some exchanges already during this uh, Baku forum on the content, the outlook uh, in that domain and, and what kind of solutions should be brought in the field of financing and others. I would like to ask you uh, a question from another order, maybe to elaborate a little bit on your view how Azerbaijan through this very, um, let's say, active diplomatic initiatives like hosting COP29, how you see the future role of Azerbaijan broader than its own territory, where uh, thankfully things are settled, as you mentioned, but how you see the role of this country in the broader region uh, in a strong alliance, of course, with, with Turkey. Well, thank you very much for the question and for your patience. Um, you have stated that we as Turkey have um, excellent relations with Azerbaijan and for a long time uh, we've been enjoying our cooperation to further advance our cooperation in economic and uh, regional development fields. And we've been closely following uh, with pride uh, that Azerbaijan is a rising star in the Caucasus in terms of uh, the stability that they bring, in terms of the economic and growth speed that uh, they bring to our region. And uh, for in recent years, for example, Azerbaijan has started uh, playing a very uh, pivotal role uh, in the Caucasus, uh, you know, in a very positive role, and it is becoming a hub for regional diplomacy and regional ownership and regional projects. Uh, we, as Turkey alone, work with them on numerous issues, you know, uh, the rail work, the connectivity projects, the energy projects, and uh, economic projects. Uh, the last year, uh, I was here just to attend uh, in Shusha, uh, the International Meeting of uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation. And, uh, and as you said, I mean, this year uh, they will hold uh, a COP meeting. And uh, today uh, they are holding this famous forum, uh, consecutive ninth time. And altogether, there are other events that um, I am not remembering now that Azerbaijan is uh, actually uh, actively either hosting or participating. Uh, and also, Azerbaijan is playing a very important role in Europe's energy security. Whoever I meet in Europe these days, they also uh, seek our assistance to get a close to Azerbaijan and to have uh, better discussions on energy security. And these are just a couple of examples that I can only give now. Maybe I should be stop here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, from my side, maybe a second question and then I will invite my colleagues to uh, ask you questions from the, from, the, from the audience. My second question would relate to the current debates about um, let's say, the repositioning of Europe in the NATO alliance and the thinking about a future new secu security architecture in Europe. Uh, maybe just a broad question, how you see these debates and, and what uh, the vision of Turkey would be uh, in, in on these debates and where they should lead to? 
Again, thank you, Prime Minister. This is another uh, very important question that uh, we are actually working on it very, very hard because uh, uh, European security architecture is now uh, involved uh, in a shape of European Union, you know, and uh, increasingly European Union and NATO uh, is having an overlapping agenda, if not uh, operational or uh, logistic. Uh, platforms. Uh, what does it mean for Turkey? You know, Turkey has been left outside of European Union membership for some time, and you know, there is no light on the horizon for us to be a member of European Union, but we are a member of NATO. The tendency that the European Union uh, and the, almost all of them are NATO members. So, uh, European Union as a group within NATO has started playing a dominating role now, which is understandable. But countries like Turkey and Norway, Canada, you know, we are not member of European Union, but we are member of NATO, and we have our own legitimate security concerns. If NATO's agenda is dominated by too much the priorities of European Union, and our security concerns are left out, so that uh, creates a little bit problem. This is uh, one point that we are drawing the attention of our allies uh, in Europe and in North America. So I think uh, one of the major issues within NATO and European security architecture is uh, how to combine European Union security uh, interests with NATO. I mean, now the assumption is, the impression is, it has be, the, the two have become almost identical. So there is no even discussion about this. Uh, but in reality, a NATO has a different uh, command and control mechanism. And they have uh, been largely contributed by and led by the American armed forces. Uh, so as Turkey, as I said, I mean, we'll be, uh, we, we are uh, closely following these developments and uh, whenever we attend the uh, ministerial meetings or leader summit and also technical levels, we are uh, bringing forward these discussion points and we raise our concerns. I think uh, the good thing is uh, there is a good environment to really include all the argumentations and the discussions into the larger policy making framework. And uh, we've been enjoying a good dialogue with the NATO, Secur NATO Secretary General and uh, his staff and with some other key NATO partners. But just a few other questions, uh, maybe if I have time, uh, regarding uh, Turkey's uh, position vis-a-vis -vis NATO countries. There are two issues that we've raised, uh, especially in the last two years, uh, which were caused by, on the occasion of acceptance of Finland and Sweden as member of NATO. You know, the main argument was those two countries are valuable for NATO, NATO's expansion, and their <coughs> membership would make NATO stronger. We said, look, I mean, if we are talking about making NATO and NATO countries safer and stronger, so we have some points to make too. One is, uh, I mean, if you look at the Turkey's physical security and territorial integrity, we have a big threat on the other side of our border. You know, PKK, YPG, PKK in Iraq, its extension in Syria, YPG in Syria. They've been assisted, empowered, and tasked by some NATO countries. You know, the America is doing this openly and some few other NATO countries are assisting with the America. So we are NATO country, they are NATO country, and some NATO countries coming together when a non-NATO, non-state element, a terror organization, to address an issue, which is a counter-terrorism issue, they call it, but also it is creating a huge threat against my national security problem. This is one issue that we raise. The second issue, we are a member of NATO and we are member states and 
the whole point of creating NATO to make the member states countries uh, safer and create an environment and platform where they can be in strong solidarity. Yet, as member of NATO, we've been subjected to a number of declared and undeclared restrictions, defense industry restrictions by some NATO countries. So we also open this issue into debate too. So on the one hand, uh, the counter-terrorism concerns of Turkey, starting from PKK and YPG. On the other hand, uh, the uh, defense industry uh, restrictions against Turkey. And I think we've had a very good and healthy discussions around these subjects, which I don't want to go into detail. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, frank and open answers. Thank you. As mentioned, uh, one or two questions from the room, maybe Eka. Microphone, thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, Minister, thank you very much for devoting so much time to us today. Former Foreign Minister and Deputy Vice Prime Minister of Georgia, member of the NGAC board. Um, I want to continue perhaps with the last question that you've answered already quite comprehensively, but to switch attention a little bit to the Black Sea area. It's quite clear within the last few years already, abundantly clear to everybody, that there is one country that poses threat to all of the members of the NATO, collectively or individually, and that's Russia, which tries to revise the borders, and then with that, craft or recraft its position, not only regionally, but then I would say globally as well in so many ways. And Black Sea is at the epicenter of all of that. We see not only what is happening in the Black Sea with the disruption of evil civil navigation, there are already plans in my own country, in occupied region of Abkhazia, to rebuild the military naval base, that Russia is talking about. That's a significant change in the Black Sea if that uh, would materialize. Turkey has been and is a pivotal country in the Black Sea region, member of NATO and custodian in so many ways of the security of the region. Would you think that there is momentum right now for Turkey to lead the new vision, new strategy, and commitment from NATO to strengthen security of the Black Sea in a meaningful sense so that we are in a position where deterrence could work better rather than, com than the realities we are already in the conflict. NATO needs to react to something that is already happening. Would you think that the gap is there and then the gap needs to be filled and you could play a role in it uh, as a leading country in the Black Sea region? Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think uh, this is another uh, important topic on our agenda all the time. The, uh, Diplomacy, uh, defense, and intelligence in Turkey. Uh, this is uh, one of the overlapping issues for all of us, and one of the uh, issues that brings us together around the table all the time. The security of Black Sea, and what to do with Black Sea security. First of all, I think our main diagnosis is uh, to prevent increasing militarization of Black Sea, because Black Sea, uh, for a long time, uh, before the war, I think, uh, was enjoying uh, quietness and a sea of transportation of the goods and services. This was very much important. After the war, the militarization of Black Sea has created huge problems for us. First of all, as you know, uh, the uh, interruption of the shipment of the grain from Ukraine was a disaster for the entire world, especially uh, I mean, for the, uh, the global south, for some African countries, and in general, the, uh, the food market, the prices went up. So uh, the President Erdogan, I mean, uh, he was very sensitive on, uh, especially on uh, the food security for the entire world. He worked very hard to ensure a solution between Ukrainians and the Russians to bring about a grain deal. We managed it, but it lasted a certain time, within which time I think uh, overall 33 million ton grain was shipped to the rest of the world. 
Today we are working on a similar arrangement together with UN and with partner countries. I just hope and pray that we really reach an agreement. This time it will not be maybe named as Green Deal initiative, maybe another thing, but eventually the most important thing is to get the grain out of Black Sea. Not only the grain, but also uh, to other goods uh, out of Black Sea to make sure that Black Sea serves for commercial purposes for the entire region. But the issue that you raised, the aggression, the militarization, and the threat and the uh, risk of interrupting the trade and the security of the uh, littoral countries are there. So therefore, I mean, if you paid, uh, I'm sure, I mean, uh, that's why I had a section in my speech, uh, in a way, maybe indirectly addressing your question. We need to calm down the uh, ongoing war uh, in Ukraine. So far, I mean, the war itself is a huge tragedy, caused the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and the destruction of entire infrastructure and superstructure of uh, Ukraine. Uh, but we haven't seen geographical escalation yet. It's confined within Ukraine. And we haven't seen uh, a methodological e escalation of the war techniques. I'm still a conventional warfare. It's not a it's not involved at this moment the use of WMDs, uh, weapons of mass destruction. This is, this is a big plus. But how long can we have this luxury? If there is a wider escalation, what will happen? When we discuss about the wider escalation, the, one of the immediate vicinity is certainly Black Sea. That's why we pay extremely close attention what kind of, you know, the risks and alternative scenarios that we can be exposed to, we can be subject to, and not only us, but also we are discussing some of the uh, countries in the region, including Georgia. Today I had a, a very good meeting with my Georgian counterpart after our trilateral meeting. Again, I mean, uh, at this meeting we also uh, discuss uh, this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a last question. Ready to take a last question? Yeah, from the floor. I would privilege members of NGIC, so I give the floor first row, please. Thank you, Your Excellency. I'm from Libya, and you mentioned that you are now involved to help the Libyan reaching their dreams of an election that they have been waiting for for the last four or five years. So I would like very much to ask you to elaborate on that. And I'm sure you know very well that the players in Libya are from every corner of this globe. So are you coordinating with those who are involved in Libya as well? And are you or shall you give us some happy news that maybe, maybe, we can reach election by the end of 2024. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all your efforts that you are also doing for Gaza and saving the children and the, the, the mother and the elderly and the people. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Libya is another important su subject on our agenda. Is you know, I mean, it is, 2019, uh, there has been a new uh, status quo in Libya now. And uh, I mean, of course, I'm going to speak through our personal lenses. I mean, uh, for us, for Turkey, the most important priority for us at the moment in Libya is not to see another conflict. We don't want to see the uh, resumption of the conflict. This is number one priority. That's why. Uh, our presence, our contacts, our work have always been focusing on this priority, not to see any other conflict. As we saw in Syria and elsewhere, after the conflict, 
if you can manage to have some quiet period, the longer you have this time, the better the, the, the chances that you have a peaceful solution. But there are certain dynamics in Libya, as you know. And uh, we cannot change these dynamics by force, which we don't want to change. It means war. Uh, I will mention a couple of them. East and West, we cannot let them stay divided forever. And we cannot let them to go to war to unify unilaterally in favor of one of the actors. So what can we do? This is the major question. As I said, number one priority is not to have a resumption of the conflict, but the second question is how to advance through political solutions. Again, through Turkey's perspective, uh, what we do is, you know, historically, I mean, uh, we align ourselves in the beginning with the West, which, uh, with, with, with legitimate government. But also we expanded our contacts and relations with the East. And uh, in the last couple of years, as you know, we normalize our relations with uh, Egypt and UAE and Saudis and some other regional countries too. And then we have used these normalized relations to bring some positive mood to Libya because our friends in, in the eastern part of Libya, they have close affinity and connections with certain actors uh, with Egypt and UAE and others. So now around the table, Alhamdulillah, as we say, now these three, four countries, we can come together. Now we are actually in and really can have a very high quality discussions about what to do. What will be our role to really uh, contribute Libya's first peace and then unification, then independence and sovereignty. Of course, there are a big number of differences, uh, but I am optimistic. And uh, I hope that uh, in the near future, uh, we can have some good news. But the best news always is not to have a renewed conflict. This is what we are working around the clock all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you for your address, for uh, honoring uh, NGIC with your presence and the candid way you answered questions. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Th thank you very much for hosting me, Prime Minister, and for the patience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.